Um, so hopefully you all have managed to find Illustrator on these computers. If not, say so or ask someone next to you. Um, sorry? It doesn't work. Uh, well, I... All right, well, the, you can forget about the, the demo files. It's just like some examples. Um, you can get them later. Um, I don't... I don't manage these computers, obviously, so I don't know how to troubleshoot them. They don't have Illustrator right now, so sorry about that. Um, I'm recording everything that's on my, my screen, so you can look it up later if I'm going too quickly, or uh, you know, share it with other people who aren't here. Um, so my plan for today is, you know, it's called Intro to Digital Scientific Illustration, but what that really means is uh, I'm assuming that most of you are scientists and want to illustrate the things you work on, but don't really know how to use Adobe Illustrator. So I'm going to show you how that software works. Um, I'm not going to get into like aesthetics or what uh, color palettes are prettier than others and whatnot. Uh, it's really just uh, how to how to get the software to do what you want. Um, so really, the the two steps of what we're going to do today are. Uh, to you download some files that I prepared ahead of time, but those are not critical, really. They're just uh, some examples. And then just to get a bunch of practice using the software, which you'll have to continue doing after the session today if you want to really make use of it. Um, and then down here, I put my email address. You're all welcome to email me questions later on, too, if you have any. Uh, so with that, let's just get started. Um, this here is Illustrator that, that I've made this, this thing in. So you can already see that you can obviously make text in it and also uh, various shapes and illustrations that we'll get into later. Um, there's here uh, in this file, if you download it, is a sort of mock up of a bunch of things that I want to try and cover today, assuming uh, we get time to go through all of it. Or if not, then um, we'll just get as far as we can. <laughs> Excuse me. So, uh, you know, there's just I'll show you how to make some basic shapes and give them different colors and whatnot, and um, and then some slightly more advanced shapes over here in, in panel B, and then panel C is complicated and would be annoying to make, but you'll see it's really a, a repeating pattern over and over again, which is something that a lot of us I think would find useful to to be able to do in our illustrations um, because we study things like DNA or, or um, you know, polymers or membranes like this here. So I'll show you how to do that really easily. Um, and D, again, this is a, a protein schematic. So I, I, it's really just made up of some, some uh, colored uh, rounded rectangles and text and some, some gradients and whatnot. So uh, we'll quickly go through that. In F here, I'll show you how to import an image from somewhere else and then how to crop it and, and uh, manipulate it so it looks the way you might want it to here. And then uh, E and G, sorry, I got out of order there. These are plots that I've imported from either Excel or Prism, which I think are pro programs that probably a lot of you use for actually uh, gathering your data. So I'll, sh I'll show you how to get that stuff into Illustrator um, if we get to it. But really, it's a matter of copying and pasting and then manipulating it slightly once it's in Illustrator. So <clears throat> the first thing I want to point out when we, we focus on, on panel A here is that you should try and divorce yourselves from the notion that these images are like a grid of pixels where you know this pixel is green, this pixel is blue. Because really, um, all of these images here are vector drawings that are Resolution independent, aside from the microscope image at the bottom, obviously. So what that means is that I can zoom in on any one of these, and you know, no pixels are going to appear. It's just perfectly smooth no matter how far I go. And that's really useful because it means you can just make your artwork or make your, you know, your graph or whatever, and then rescale it and reshape it however you like for your final purpose. Maybe you want to make it bigger 
for a poster presentation a year from now, and then you can just do that, and it, it won't look any worse because it's pixelated or something like that. So really, this triangle is just defined as three dots in space, and then there's some information about the colors in between those dots. And that's um, all there is to it. Um, here, there's obviously more information about the color and the shadow and, and whatnot. But all of this is uh, not just telling it what to put at what pixel, but, but really defining what the lines are of these object outlines and then telling it what to put where. So this here was like my, um, my outline for what I want to cover today. I think the best way to approach this would be to make a brand new document and then I'll sort of guide you through all of these things uh, step by step. Uh, so I'm going to do that here. And I'm going to, I'm used to using a lot of keyboard shortcuts, so I'm going to try not to do that here just so you can follow along in the, on the screen easier what I'm doing. Uh, in the new document, I'm just going to choose all the defaults and hit OK. It gives me this brand, this uh, blank white paper shaped uh, rectangle. And the first thing I usually do when I open a new document is to actually get rid of this outline because I don't care of the size and shape of what it's going to end up as um, usually. So I go to view and then um, hide artboards. And that just makes the whole screen white and it lets me not worry about what's where and I'll just make a bunch of artwork and then rearrange it later. Of course, if you're making a, a poster that has to be three by four feet or something, then you might want to keep that in mind right from the start. But it, as I say, it's always easy to resize things. So now we have this blank space. And so there's really, um, on, at the left here, I hope you all have, have these tools. Maybe they're arranged slightly differently. If, if you don't see this on the left and this on the right here, you should go to um, Window, Workspace, and then choose the Essentials workspace, and that should give you essentially the same layout I have here or, or something close to it. <laughs> so let's start off by just making a, a square or a rectangle. There's this rectangle tool. You click on it and drag across the screen, and it makes a little rectangle for you. And so now, for the next five or 10 minutes, we're just going to modify this rectangle in various ways. The most obvious way, of course, is to give it some color. So at the top here, you can choose from some color presets for both the interior and the boundary of this rectangle. Um, and also you can, of course, choose uh, the colors uh, with more precision in this, uh, this kind of color picker by double clicking on these, these uh, interior or boundary color indicators at the bottom of that tool panel. Now, if I want to change the shape of this rectangle, I have to uh, I generally go right back up to the selection tool at the very top. So there are two arrows at the top. One of them is black and one is white. And so those do different things, and I'll get into both of them. They're both very important. But the black arrow is the selection tool that just selects entire objects. It lets you move them around. And if you go near a corner, it lets you rotate them. If you hold down Shift, it lets you rotate them by you know, set 45-degree angles. If you hold down Shift while um, while moving, I guess it uh, does nothing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, so anyway, you selected your object. Now, maybe you want to uh, make the the outline thicker. So that's the that's called the stroke in Illustrator. At the top here is the stroke um, width. So you can make that whatever something thicker. You can choose a bunch of other parameters. This is an empty menu for me. All right, we'll go over here. Um, on the right-hand side are a bunch of other uh, buttons. So these are not tools that let you, you know, select things. These are sort of things with which you can modify existing objects. So again, at the top are colors. This is where I usually modify the colors of things. So if I have an object selected, then here I choose the interior and I just scroll along here until it looks, you know, the way I want it to look for whatever purpose. Um, or I could click on the outline here again and change the outline color by that method. Um, you're already seeing that there are at least three different ways to change these colors on the screen right now, and it really doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, but I was talking about um, the, two, the two arrows. So we've got a rectangle, and let's say we want to make it more interesting. We want a different shape. So let's choose the direct selection tool, the white arrow. And now, instead of 
um, choosing the, now instead of selecting the entire rectangle, what we can do is select just one of the corners. Like if you, if you move near it, it'll highlight, or it'll show you a little uh, square at the corner, and these are called anchor points. So if you select just that anchor point and drag it around, you can change the shape of your rectangle. <laughs> um, you can select multiple anchor points, like by dragging a little selection rectangle around them using this direct select tool, and then move those around together. So these are useful ways for modifying shapes of things after having created them. You can add anchor points uh, or delete them from objects. So that's the, um, if you click and hold the pen tool, which it looks like a fountain pen, and among these are the, the add and a direct selection tool and move them around to make some kind of Awesome shape. Um, so you can you can start to see here how you can make shapes for you know your your proteins of interest uh, to to do to illustrate whatever it is you're you're talking about. Um, there are of course lots of jagged edges here. You might want to have some some rounded uh, objects. So to start that, I'm gonna just um, create a, an ellipse or a circle. So in the, under the rectangle tool, another option is the ellipse tool. And you can just drag and drop that the same way as before to create an ellipse. And you'll notice that the colors of this thing you just drew are exactly the same colors and stroke outline as the heavily modified rectangle from before. That's because Illustrator just remembers the settings for the most a recently selected object that, that it's creating. Um, so that's really useful if you're making lots of objects that you want to have the same color. You can just you know, draw a bunch of them and they'll all look the same. And if you want to, then you can modify them later. This circle now also has anchor points. So for example, it has four of them. I think one top, bottom, left, and right. But if you select these, you can drag them around as before. But of course, they're, they're part of a curve. I'm going to undo that. Um, so they don't just give you a jagged corner like in this rectangle. And so as a result of that, in addition to the anchor point, what you see here, if I zoom in, are these, um, these handles that stick out from either end of the anchor point. So you can drag those around to modify the shape of this curve to fit your, your needs. So by combining these various things, you can really create any shape you like, even just starting from a, a, a circle or a rectangle. Um, I, I just zoomed in and out, and that's a really useful thing to do. So the, the quick way to do that um, is to hold the Option key on the keyboard or Alt on a PC, and then use the mouse scroll wheel. Um, so that I pretty much have my hand near, the, near that key all the time. The other key that I use all the time is the space bar, because if you hold the space bar and then drag around the image, it lets you pan around it. So I'm always moving around left and right and zooming in on whatever I, precise feature I'm working on. Um, so I just showed you how to create uh, you know, fancy objects from a rectangle or from a circle. But you can, of course, also just start from nothing and draw an object, uh, either by using the pen tool, which is uh, accessed in this, this menu here with the fountain pen. So this lets you basically draw the locations of where your anchor points will be by clicking and dragging and clicking and dragging over and over again to make little rounded uh, corners. And once you, once you go back to the original, then it'll be a, a closed object, and that object will be done. You can also just click, and then there'll be uh, you know, non-rounded corners in that object. So that gets, lets you do the same kinds of things as you could do by modifying an existing object. And a lot of that is um, how you'll be making all of your objects and all of your illustrations. I think you can probably imagine how you could use this to create you know, a cartoon of a protein, or also perhaps you know, the, the 
graphs or the, the, the axes of a graph by making a, a, a square and then adding some lines to the sides, et cetera. Um, so I'll, I'll basically um, let your imagination run wild with that and show you a couple tricks now to make these look even fancier. Um, so first of all, if I stretch this, the, the um, outline gets bigger. You can, you can see that hopefully, that the, the red outline here is bigger. And you might not want that. Sometimes when you're scaling something, making it 10 times bigger, you want the outline to be the same. Or, you, or if it has a shadow, you want the shadow to be the same size, but the whole thing to get bigger. And the way to change that behavior is under the general preferences of Illustrator as a, an option for scaling strokes and effects, which I have activated here, but sometimes I deactivate it. I just wanted to point that out. I'll just leave it like this for now. Um, so I'm hitting the space bar here and just zooming in and out with the option key. Um, going back to my outline here, I've shown you basically how to do these things in panel A. So now I'll go get into making something like in panel B where we have two objects that fit together. Um, they have a shadow, they have gradients on their insides, um, and then there's an arrow to, to indicate that they do, they do something together. So let's, let's try and create something like that. I'm going to make a rectangle, or a square even, by holding down shift while dragging out the rectangle. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I'm going to make a copy of this. So the way I do that, of course, I could just select the, rec the, the square and copy and paste it, and then it'll, it'll, it'll have another copy of that in the Illustrator file. The easier way is to just hold Option and click and drag this rectangle somewhere else. So now there's two of it. If you hold shift while dragging, it'll stay along, it'll move along a horizontal or vertical line. So these are nicely arranged now. I'm going to add some anchor points. So I'm going to the add anchor point tool or hitting plus. I'm going to add one here. And I'm going to the direct select tool, the white arrow, selecting these bottom two anchor points and dragging them over to the left. I'm holding shift now to make them go straight over to the left. Now I realize that I want another anchor point in here, so I'm going to go back to the add anchor point tool, add that, direct select again, and move that anchor point down to, to make it look the way I like. So that's that first, uh, first part of this here. Now the other one, um, obviously I can make it look however I want. Well, let's say it's supposed to fit in there by just moving in into this position in the end. Um, so I'm going to uh, leave it in this general shape for now, but add the, the little puzzle piece notch into each of these. So that's just going to be a matter of adding some more anchor points, um, maybe three on each of these, in each of these positions here. And then rearranging those so that So this is a, a good start. This could clearly fit into that one. I'm going to change the colors just so I can refer to them by color. So over here in the color sliders, I'll, uh, I'll make the interior green, let's say. So the green one could easily fit into the blue one. But I want it to look a little rounder. So I'm going to select this anchor point right here at the tip of these, rectang of these triangles. I, I select one of them, and with the Shift key, I can select the other one. And I want these to be rounded. So at the top now, uh, at the top of the screen, once you have some anchor points selected, you can convert them between being a corner or a smoothed curve. Click the smooth curve, you can see it uh, converted it. It gave it some handles here. You can zoom in by scrolling while holding the shift key. And now uh, for this anchor point, I'll, I'll just change its shape a little bit to, to be the way I want it. <coughs> Same here. You can copy anchor points, and it's, it's not something I do very often, so I can't tell you exactly how it'll behave. Like I just dragged over these three here, and copied them, pasted them there, so it does that. Um, and then you could connect these to some other object. Um, that's one thing I didn't mention. If I had two different objects, or not connected, 
I could join them by selecting these two anchor points, for example, and then going to Object Path Join. And same down here. So you can merge objects like that. That would have been another way to make a shape here that matches the missing part there. But I'll delete this for now. So this looks pretty good to me, I think. Maybe they don't match each other perfectly, but we can imagine. So let's make them have a gradient shape, or a gradient color. To do that, I'm going to just do one at a time. Select the blue one here. And on the far right is the, you know, the modifiers uh, toolbar. And one of the objects, one of the buttons here is the gradient button. If you click it, the, the default option is just a white to black uh, linear gradient. So you could click that and give that gradient to your object. Often I prefer radial gradients that have like a, a central focal point and then radiate out to, to a different color. So I'm going to choose the type to, to be radial. And then I want to change the colors to be something other than white and black. So I can double click on the white or the black at the bottom of this gradient uh, selector here and then just choose some other color like light blue and dark blue, for example. That looks much nicer already. Um, the center of the gradient is now the center of the object, which is calculated by some formula for complex objects. But you can define where you want that to be. So now with this object selected, if you go to the far left where there's another gradient button, a gradient tool, this is where you would define the actual uh, parameters of this gradient. And you can just click and drag, and it'll um, basically create a new gradient for her, however you define it. So I like, I kind of want this to be like the active site of an enzyme or something. So I'm going to click and drag this out like that and have that be like the focal point of the color there. And then you could uh, modify the shape of this some more and change how the colors are distributed, however you like. Um, if I go back to the selection tool now, it's still just an object that I can drag around and the gradient follows it everywhere. You can modify the gradient by over here as well, just by, by dragging this around. You can add other colors to it by clicking in between the two colors at the bottom. So you could do something like that. It looks horrible. Um, so I'll get rid of it again by dragging it out. So those are the options for, for gradients. And I'll just quickly make one over here as well. First, I'll, I'll just add the same gradient as that first one, and I'll change it to some other color, like uh, make it yellow on one end and red on the other. And then that was like the original default. I think it remembers what the most recent gradient was for, you know, when I, if I make an object later, it'll, it'll still have this gradient now. If you don't want the gradient anymore. Or <laughs> Yeah. I guess. I'm not sure I follow. Why don't you ask me later? <laughs> um, all right. So this is how I had in, what I had in mind here. Um, yeah. Okay. What else did I have in this little preview here? I had a uh, these corners are rounded on these rec on these squares here, and then there's an arrow, and it have they have shadows. So let's add those things just so you can see how it works. To round corners, I'm going to select all the the ones the anchor points that I want to be round. So I'm going to drag and then hold shift and select the relevant anchor points on both of these uh, former squares. And then at the top of the screen, you can see a little um, a menu item that says corners, and you can indicate the, the radius of that corner. So I don't know what's going to look good here. Scale, I would want to be larger than, um, I don't know, let's say 40 pixels here. This, excuse me? Yeah, I could convert those to, to to um, smooth anchor points instead, if I actually so if I go back and make them zero radius corners and make them curves instead of 
uh, changing the corner radius, then it does this. It makes them like balloon out, which you might want for other purposes, but that's not my goal right now. So this is uh, this is my little illustration here. Now I might want to give them shadows. So you can select both of these objects so that the shadow gets applied to both of them. And we're going to add some uh, some effects now, or just one. There's an effects menu at the top. And so the shadow is under stylize, and then it's drop shadow. <clears throat> um, and basically, you can just see what the defaults do for you by hitting preview on this little window that opens up. And I guess it takes a little while to calculate it, but then um, there's a little shadow on there now. This is this uh, seven point distance of the shadow is not big enough for the scale of the illustration that I've made here. So I'm just going to make it bigger. Uh, type in a number. You can imagine playing with these to make it look good. All right. And then just hit OK when you like what you see. Now, even if you rotate this object, the shadow is still going to go in the same direction to over to the, to the right in this case, because that's how we define the shadow. So it's, it's not just calculating what the shadow looks like once and then defining it as, as a permanent object. This is really a modification of whatever the underlying curved lines of this object are defined as. And you can modify that further later on by going over here under Appearance on the right with a, a selected object. It shows you all the different modifications or or um, attributes of that object. So you can see it has this drop shadow, and I could hide that temporarily, and reapply it later, um, which means it has to recalculate. It has all the colors here as well, and this is just like a summary of, of what, what this object uh, looks like. Um, so I'm going to rotate that a little bit again, move it, and then I'll put an arrow between these two just to indicate that they work together somehow, maybe. Now, everything I've shown you so far has been objects and not single lines, but lines are just uh, the same as objects that don't uh, circle back on themselves. They're not, they're unclosed objects, basically. You could make a straight line with this line segment tool here, just drag it like, like any other object. Or you could use the pen tool to make a curved line, which is what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to draw a curve like that. And then it's waiting for the next point, so I'll just hit escape. Or, or choose some other tool here to get, to get out of that pen tool mode. This line is yellow because the most recently selected object had a yellow outline here. So I'm going to change that to be, say, dark gray. And I'll delete this other line. Now I want to modify this line in various ways. So at the right-hand side of the screen here is the stroke tool, where you can modify everything about the stroke. You can change its width. You could change its uh, cap, the way it behaves. So I'm going to zoom in on it. You can see the edges here are, are square. And I kind of want it to be rounded at one end, and it'll have an arrow at the other end. So the cap can be round. That's what I'm choosing here. You could also have the cap be square, but extend around the anchor point, as opposed to, as opposed to terminating at the anchor point, which is useful in certain circumstances. Now I want this to be a dashed line or a dotted line, so I'll just click on this box right here under the stroke options. And then I can define how long the dashes are supposed to be. Uh, if I choose a length of zero, then they become dots, as long as there's a gap between them. 50 points or something. Um, or if I choose a length of greater than zero, then there'll be dashes. And then below that, I can choose arrowheads. So. This is the beginning of the line, and this is the end, and I remember which orientation I drew it in, so I know I want an arrow at the end. It looks like that now. So I'll zoom out to see if that's an appropriate scale. I can change the size of the arrowhead with this little percent marker here. I'll make it 70%. There, that looks pretty good to me. Close this again. So that's what that, um, that's how I made this illustration. Here are two things that, that work together to do something, and. Uh, maybe come apart under circum cir certain circumstances, too. Um, so that's really basics of creating shapes and um, modifying their characteristics. 
Now I want to show you this, this uh, fancier method here for creating really complex shapes as long as they're made up of repeating elements. Like, uh, in this case, it was a, a lipid membrane. So the way you do that is you first create you know, the element that you're trying to repeat a million times and then tell Illustrator how to repeat it. So in the case of this lipid, which I'll just recreate here, you, should, you, could, you can do this with any object that you feel like making. Um, I'm going to make a little circle. And now it's a dashed line because of what we were doing before. I'm going to undo that, get rid of the dashed line. I'm going to make it solid black. I'm going to fill it with white for reasons that will be clear later. And I'm going to make it really thick because it, it'll need to stand out when we make this much smaller later as part of that complex object. So I don't know what, uh, something 40 pixels thick under on my screen. We all might be at different zoom levels right now because we don't have the context of the page width anymore. So you just, just make it look good for your size screen there. Um, and now, so this is like the head group of the lipid, and I'll add some tails um, by drawing them like this and un unselecting that path, and I'll make another one, something like that. Hit escape. Oop, there we go. That. There we go. That looks all right to me. Um, and these two, these two tails here, I don't want to have the white fill. I'm going to make those have a uh, no fill whatsoever, which is this uh, white square with a red line through it. So that's just going to be transparent in between the, the lines. Now this is going to be a, a double a lipid bilayer, so it's going to have two copies of this on either side. I'm going to make a copy by hitting Option or Alt Shift to drag it down ah. um, vertically, and then I'm going to rotate it nine, uh, 180 degrees again by holding shift and now move it up so it's sort of lined up with the with the first one so now these are like a little sub segment of a little lipid layer by layer i select all of them together now this is what i want to repeat over and over again um so in order to get illustrator to do that i have to go um actually i'll, I'll slow down a second just to make sure you're all caught up because the next step is crucial um there's this brush, brushes panel on the right, which is where you see all these different, um, what are called brushes in Illustrator language. And these are ways you can modify the shape of a stroke. Um, and so I'm gonna create a new brush by selecting all these objects I just made, dragging them into the brushes panel, and then it'll give me this options window for new brush. And what I'm trying to make here is a pattern brush. So I'll just hit OK under the pattern brush. And then uh, these are the options for our new brush. I'll leave them all as the default. You could obviously give it a name or, or change other things if you wanted to. The only thing I'm going to change now is the colorization method, which will be tints. It's not crucial, but it allows to change the color later on easily. Then I'll hit OK. Now I have a new brush in this brushes window. You can barely see it, but uh, it's there. And so now if I zoom out and make a new line, um, something like that, and select it, and then go to the brushes window and just click on my new brush, it'll have a repeated pattern of the thing I just made. And of course, this looks terrible, because <laughs> it's at a very poor, it's not at the right scale to make a good image of this. So. What I need to make, what I need to change is the, the thickness of this brush. I'll change the stroke width to something much smaller, like 0.25 pixels or even less. You can type in any number here, because again, this is all totally arbitrary scaling as far as scaling goes. The other reason it doesn't look so good is that there's this kind of sharp corner here. So I'll just drag this over here and maybe make it a smoother curve. So there you go. That's a, a nice. Um, repeating unit and again if I zoom in as much as I want here it's all still nice and smooth so you can scale this however you like you could make a strand of DNA or you know, uh, an actin filament or whatever you want by using this method oh, to make the new brush what I did is I grabbed this these objects here and I just dragged them over into the brushes panel
So the brushes panel is at the, the right. It's this uh, looks like a bucket full of brushes. So you, you just. Can you brush from the squares that you made? Yeah, sir. We can. Just like one of them. Yeah, I, I can select these these objects here as well, for example, and drag them over into the brushes. I'll make I'll make it a pattern brush again. Just hit OK. So now I have a new brush here, and I can select this um, this line here and click on my new brush there, and it's got these objects here repeated over and over again. So it's all. Um, it, it'll just take whatever you give it. Now, this is now a black lipid bilayer, and I might want to change the color. So because I told it to be able to, um, now I can change the, sh the color of this to be pink or something, and it works perfectly well. And of course, I can make a circle have this brush as its outline as well. So that's this is a brand new circle. I'll make it look, uh, I'll make it have that brush as its outline, something like that. So that looks like a little vesicle. Any question? Two separate elements in it? Yeah. Like if you have this circle set up, could you then reapply the element to brush this? Like change the brush later on? Um, yeah. So, well, first of all, I already have the oops, the the objects here that I'm used to make the brush. So I could just make another brush if I wanted to that was slightly modified. Um, so yeah, I, I I could change the colors of you know one half of this or, or both of these here. Let's try that. These can be blue. So now if I create a, a new brush with that, okay, that's what it'll look like. Um, it'll just take whatever you give it. The, the way I changed the colors here was under the options for this brush, I, I allowed a, a colorization method of tints. Is anyone having trouble with that or have a question? I can't hear you, sir. Um, so I, I made it pink by by within this, by double clicking on this brush here, or during the creation of the brush, you saw this options window, and I made sure to choose tints down here under colorization method. So if that's selected, um, and then you you make a circle and give it this brush as its outline, then you can change the color of that circle, and it'll change the color of the of the brush. Yeah. Is there a way to make a brush that has white space around it? When you select those two ribbons, you can choose the type of ribbons. Yep. What if you wanted to make the element of space? If you double click on the brush again, yeah. there are options here. So under fit, you can, right now the, the default was stretch to fit, but there are other, I think, I think add space to fit is what you want, maybe. Um, or maybe not. There, there are different options here. Also at the top, for example, you could have uh, space. Oh yeah, there it is. The spacing is set to zero. If I chose a spacing of say 100%, then it would leave 100% um, of the width of each object in between each object. Um, so yeah, you can definitely play around with that. You could set, I think, the spacing to, to negative to have them overlap a little bit, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, there are other types of brushes. Um, which I won't get into, but uh, you know, you can you can make a brush that scatters objects near a path if you were just trying to make something that looks sort of randomized. All right, so in my demo here, I made this uh, this this vesicle here have a you know a blue membrane and then also a blue interior. So I'll just show you how I did that. Except I'll make it red here. So basically, I'm selecting this circle which has this out outline. I'm copying it, and then I'm going to paste it right on top of itself by pasting in place from the, the edit menu or using this keyboard shortcut here. So now there's two copies of this right on top of each other, and you can't tell unless you move one of them. So I'll undo that. And I only want one of them to have that, that 
membrane shape. So I'll change the other one to be the interior color that I want. So if I go to the colors modifier here, choose you know, something, whatever I think might look pretty here for the, the interior and then also for the exterior, maybe I want this to have a, oh, it changed both of them. They were both selected. So just select the one of them, then to change the color of the path. Ah, okay, that's the wrong one. Um, all right, I'll, I'll, change, I'll, I'll show you now um, what I did wrong. <laughs> Basically, I wanted, um, I wanted this to be the, the exterior and this to be the interior. Um, and, I, and I forgot that they both have this exterior on the outside. So to change the brush, you can just go back to the brushes panel, scroll all the way to the top and make it basic. There we go. Now they're misaligned, so we need to align them. I'll select them both again. At the top of the screen is this align panel. You can align things vertical, horizontal. If you have like a series of 12 objects, you can distribute them evenly, which is really useful. Uh, but right now, all I want to do is align them vertically and horizontally to each other. Now, of course, half of this lipid bilayer is hidden because the pink is on top of it. So I want to make this be underneath the other one. And to do that, I need to go to Object, Arrange, and then Send Backward, or Send all the way to the back. So this is basically all the objects are layered above each other or below each other. I'm going to send this one all the way to the bottom. And now it's underneath that. And I want now for the, the lipid here to be its own outline, rather than having this pink go all the way to the edge of that. So I'll just give this inner circle, make sure I have that selected, um, its own stroke here of, that's red, I guess. So let's make it um, yellow, say. And then make it way thicker. Like This looks like it needs to be like 300 pixels or something. Um, and if I zoom all the way in here, I can make it um, really line up with where I want it to be. Something like that. I wouldn't necessarily choose this color scheme, but that shows you how you can um, make something like this. Um, and of course, these are now still two objects, and I want them to always be together. So I'm going to select both of them by dragging across them and then group them by going to the object menu and choosing group. So now when I drag one of them, the other moves with it, which is very useful. And because this, the lipid here is, was made with a brush, I can change the shape of this. And instead of just like stretching each individual lipid, what it's going to do is add more to fill the space to make it look reasonable which is, again, pretty useful. So that's everything I wanted to say about that, unless there are questions. OK. Um, what else did I have planned here? So this here is this protein schematic. I think you already know how to do most of these things. Basically, this is three different boxes and some text in them. So I guess I should tell you how to make text. And then they're all aligned neatly, and there's a dotted line, which you know how to make. So I'll just quickly do that and talk through it without spending too much time. I'm going to go to the rounded rectangle tool underneath the rectangle or ellipse tool menu there. Draw some uh, sort of arbitrarily shaped things. These now have whatever the most recent stroke was. So I'm going to change that to be. Something more reasonable for this purpose. A black outline. And then some kind of interior color, which I'll change for each of them, just so these are different domains, obviously. Now, I want there to be a line connecting all three of them, since these are domains of a single protein. I'll choose the line tool um, and just draw a horizontal line by holding Shift. And then change the thickness of that again to be something that looks good in this context. Oop, I have to select the line. Something like that. Now, I want to arrange all these so they're right at the right position. So I'm going to select all of them, including the line, and align them to each other um, horizontally. Or I guess this is vertical alignment, sorry. There, that looks much better. Now I want the line to be underneath the, the rounded rectangles. So again, I'll go to Object, Arrange, and Send to Back, having selected the line. 
So this is my little domain layout now. And of course, each of these could have a gradient fill or some other shape if I wanted to. Uh, but this is how I'm, I'm going to do it quickly right now. Now to add text, you just go to the text tool at the far left. It's the little T icon. And T is also the keyboard shortcut to quickly select it. And I'm going to just write, uh, it's tiny. So you're seeing here, I just choose you know font size 72 just to get something tiny like this. And that's because I've been zooming, or zooming in and out so much that I've completely lost my sense of scale for this document. But it's not a big deal. Under the, having selected this text here, you see, you see a different set of options at the top. There's these paragraph alignment options, which you all know from text editors, and also the paragraph tool to change all these different alignments. Under the character tool, again, you can change the font, this line spacing, the horizontal stretch, the vertical you know, the font size, and whatnot. And you can enter any, any number you like here. So I'll change it to something bigger. That big. And I purposely didn't, when I typed this text, I purposely typed it outside of that box and then moved it in. Because if you start typing a text, if you click the text tool onto a path, it thinks you want to type along that path and it sort of replaces that path with your text. So I didn't want to do that. So I'm just going <coughs> to type these, um, these words outside of these boxes and then move them inside. The other way to do this, of course, is to just copy the text over and then edit, edit it by, again, choosing the text tool and highlighting it and modifying, modifying what it says. And now, again, I want to align all these together to make sure that they look nice. You might want to, within each box, make sure the text is aligned properly. So I'll just select those two things and vertic or horizontally align them. So there, that's my little protein domain layout. Um, I think that pretty much tells you what you need to know about that. Uh, you already, you've already seen how to add these dotted lines, for example, in the stroke options on the right-hand side here. So let's add uh, an external image to our, our file here, our, our figure. A lot of us do microscopy, and we get images that we might want to present on uh, posters or, or in a paper, obviously. So to do that, um, I'm just going to go to a blank area on my page here. And now I'm going to go outside of Illustrator to um, find whatever that file is. So I, I had that, um, that demo under the demo files that include this file that you're looking at right now. Uh, if you downloaded it, there's a, an image from a microscope that I got off Wikipedia. Or you can you know, choose whatever you like. And basically just go to File, um, where is it? Place, file place, and then choose that that image. So I'll go back to the this file here that I was modifying. Place, take this image of some rat neurons that I found, put it somewhere. So there it is. I um I just placed it. I haven't resized it or anything, so I can zoom in on it and see all the details. But otherwise, I'm I'm leaving it as is. <clears throat> now, if you, if you select this image in Illustrator, at the top of the screen, you see basically the file name of, of what you placed on there um, and some other options, like, for example, the original resolution of this image, I think. Um, and you can embed this file in Illustrator, which is useful in case you later on move the original, Illustri the original image, because Illustrator, unless you embed it, It'll keep looking for that image file every time you load the Illustrator file. So you have to embed it just to make sure it's always uh, saved together. That increases the Illustrator file size, too, so just keep that in mind. Um, so now I have this in here, and it's saved forever with my Illustrator file. Um, let's say I want to do this here. I'm going to zoom in on a section to show. So to do that, basically I need two copies of this, this image. I'll select it. Hold Option, and um, sorry, actually, let's do that later. Let's, if you already copied it, let's delete that first. We're going to first choose the area we want to zoom in on. So I, I um, somewhat arbitrarily, let's choose, uh, I'm going to choose this cell body here. I'll draw a little square around it, holding down Shift using the rectangle tool. 
And then I'm going to change the outline of this to be something reasonable, like red with no fill whatsoever. Make that thicker just so you can see it. Actually, the image is partially red, so I'll make this box green. So that's what we want to have in our, our little zoom in version. So now I'm going to select both the image and that box and copy both of them together. So now I'm holding Option, dragging these over. Now I have a copy of both of them. And um, one of these is going to become the zoomed version, and one, um, one of them is going to become the, the non-zoomed version. And you can imagine, obviously, I'm just going to resize one of them and not the other. But I do need to crop them as well. So this, this zoomed version only needs to show what's in the box. And so to do that, I'm going to create what's called a, a clipping mask. So I'm, I'm selecting both the box and the image it's, that's underneath it, either by drawing a box around it or first the box and then shift clicking on the image. And I'll go to Object, Clipping Mask, and Make. And that basically makes it so that Illustrator only displays whatever is underneath that square of the, among the other selected objects. So this now is, is a much smaller little square that only shows that little cell body right there. Um, it does still contain the entire image. So if I double click on this a couple times, it still shows you the whole image. And I could hypothetically change which part of the image I want to be zooming in on. But I'll leave it as it is right now. Then with the other one here, I'll move it over now so it's closer with a little square showing where we're zooming in. Now I'll just resize the big one, including the square. Bring it down there. So now we have a little square indicating what we're zooming in on. I'm just going to change the color one more time. Make it thicker again. There, you can see already this is taking shape and uh, showing us a cell with a little, or uh, uh, showing us what we want to see. So now I'm going to crop the bigger one as well, just to only show maybe a part of this field of view. So I'm drawing a rectangle around that, selecting the big rectangle and the cell image, and again, making a clipping mask. And so it made a clipped version of this image now. And of course, the little, rec the little square disappeared. And that's just because it's underneath the rec the, this new rectangle here. So we're going to move that image to the back again. And the little square appears above it again. And finally, to indicate the, the, the zooming, zoom in of this uh, image, I'm going to draw some lines from here to here, the way I did in my demo, uh, just to make it obvious what, what one is looking at. So I'm going to select the square, just so that the next line I draw has the same exact features. And draw a line from that anchor point to this anchor point, from here to here. And then I'm going to draw another square around this image here. And that looks pretty good to me. If you wanted to uh, maybe make this a dotted line, these two here lines dotted, again, you can go to the stroke modifiers, make them dashed or, or dotted, and change these, these numbers here to, be, to fit what you like to see on this image. How does the clipping mask represented? Is it like blank white squares? Or is it actually, so if you were to have a background of the image, would it? So outside of the object that became the clipping mask, it doesn't show anything whatsoever. <laughs> so if the like, images were above the background. It would show yeah, the like here, I'll draw a little um, a rectangle with a color, and then put it behind that image. So you can see, even though the the, the image was originally reaching out all the way to here, once I clipped it, the Everything underneath it is, is shown around it. So that's really basically a way to crop without destroying something. Um, so that's pretty useful. And then, um, are there any questions about that? Can you freehand crop something? Yeah, the clipping mask can be anything. So you could draw a shape, like any, any shape we, like the ones we drew earlier. Um, <coughs> this. This uh, fancy object here, including the dotted lines, could be hypothetically a clipping mask for something else. Um, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but basically any object can, can mask any other object. Um, where's everything? There. 
So I want to now uh, just remind you that this here is like our entire workspace, but eventually you're going to want to size this, you know, resize things to be to have a normal uh, a layout on a page. So if you go back to the view menu and show your artboards, it shows you this tiny little rectangle, unless you were working differently from me. And so now I'm just going to select my objects or resize them however I like, uh, such that they fit roughly on that page. And again, they have all the same exact characteristics, depending on whether you were scaling the strokes with them or not. Um, and that's, again, changed in the, um, the Illustrator preferences. <laughs> I can delete this uh, little thing that I used here to create that brush, by the way. The brush is, is now defined in this file, and it'll never go away. If I were to make a new Illustrator file, it wouldn't necessarily have that brush, but I could paste this object into another file, and then it, that file would then have that brush as well. So this now is all of my objects, sorry, most of my objects on a page that I might want to print or you know, uh, make part of another bigger document. Um, and I like to rearrange things a lot to make them fit nicely. So just as a reminder, grouping things is really useful so, so you don't accidentally move part of it without the other. So I'm just going to select all the individual panels of this figure and go to Object Group for each for each subgroup of objects here, and then I don't have to worry about you know losing part of one one uh, panel while moving another group. And you can of course ungroup things later. That was already grouped. So now this is my little figure. Let's say um, I uh, I can save this in multiple ways. Obviously, I can save it as an Illustrator file, but something that's very frequently useful is to just save it as a PDF file, which almost anyone can read on their computer even if they don't have Illustrator. And PDF files, just like what I've shown you here, are resolution independent. So someone could zoom in and out on that as much as they like again. In addition, um, Illustrator can actually open PDF files if they were saved in a certain way for, for modifying in, in all the ways I just showed you. So if I save this as a PDF, and send it to someone else, they could open it in Illustrator, and, and basically it would work just like an Illustrator file. Uh, of course, you don't always want a PDF, so the other way to, to save this is to either go to Export in the File menu and choose some sort of file for format here, like a TIFF, um, and save that. Or you could go to Save for Web, which is what I like to do because it gives you a nice little preview of what it would look like at a given at a chosen resolution. So this now is here a view of what this might look like at 100% scaling. So I think that's too small. I'm going to make it 300%, and it gives you now an actual um, number of pixels in this image that it's going to create. It's got this hatch mark background here because it's transparent. So I'll undo that. Now it's going to be white in the background. So now I can create a, a PNG file that has you know, 1,800 by 2,300 pixels, as opposed to just an, uh, a scaling independent Illustrator file. And then that I can share with anyone I like. And um, so that's basically the basics of uh, using Illustrator to make files and to make objects and modify them and, and uh, import images. Uh, I, I kind of rushed to the end there because it's been an hour. I'm going to uh, sh briefly show you now how to copy and paste things from Prism or Excel, um, but I, I realize the time is up, so <laughs> uh, head on out if you like. Just please fill out the um, evaluation that uh, the forms laying around in various places, and you can leave those with me um, or give them to Anik later if you want. Um, so for Prism, I, I don't have that on this computer, but I do have um, a PDF that was exported from Prism. So that's essentially the same thing. I'm just going to open that in Illustrator to illustrate how you can open a PDF in this program, and it's basically the same thing. This is just some arbitrary data I made up. 
Um, and so in Illustrator, when I open this now, you can see these are objects. I can move them around. Don't do that, obviously, with your data. <laughs> um, but I can also just copy all of this, go over to my, uh, my figure here, and paste it in, and then you know, modify it and do all the things that I just showed you. The, there's, there's some idiosyncrasies to this process of pasting in data from outside programs because, uh, for example, I think these error bars here, you know, if I select it, it looks like it's selecting the entire rectangle here, and that's because it's behind a clipping mask of some kind. I don't know why. Um, that's how Prism exported this, this image, so you can release the clipping mask from the object menu. Now when I click on this error bar, it just selects the error bars. Um, you can easily release all of the clipping masks in, this, in these objects by selecting all the objects and going to this thing here and release them. Sometimes you have to do it twice because sometimes there are masks within masks within masks. Um, so that looked like that did it. Uh, so now I might want to, I don't know, make this narrower. I selected all of the, sorry, I was a little quick here. I, I selected the, the direct selection tool using the keyboard shortcut, which is A. And then I dragged my mouse around all of this half here and moved it over just using the arrow key on the keyboard. Um, so you can modify this graph to your heart's content. You can change the colors of these dots uh, and you know, change the text on the axes, et cetera. Um, and pretty much the same thing applies to graphs you paste in from Excel, with the exception that uh, in Excel, you, I don't think you can easily, maybe you can save it as a PDF, but what I would just do is copy, <laughs> copy the graph in Excel and paste it into Illustrator and then start making similar modifications. So I left, a, I had made a, an example Excel graph in the, in the uh, materials for this course, which you could try this out with, or I'm sure lots of you have your own Excel plots that you could try, try pasting into Illustrator. And again, there are these idiosyncrasies where things are grouped and clipped in complex ways by Excel, um, and you have to ungroup them or unclip them uh, to modify them more intuitively. What I like to do sometimes, actually, I'll just do the, um, I'll do the example here. is my example. I'll just select this graph in Excel, copy it, and go into Illustrator. I'll hide it temporarily, paste it. Um, so now this is a bunch of individual objects. You know, if I can move that, and you can see again, it's inside of a weird clipping mask for some reason. What I usually do with Excel plots like this, instead of trying to un unmask and, and ungroup everything, is I just copy the data out and make my own axes. So I'm going to double click on these blue columns here once to get inside of that clipping mask, and then click them once to select them. Cut. Double click outside of the clipping group again, so it's just, you know, uh, nothing is selected now. And then paste in place. Now they're back where they belong, but now I can select them as individual objects. I'll do the same thing with these red bars. Cut. Double click outside and paste in place. Now I want to make my own axes, so I'll just draw a rectangle that has no fill and uh, a black outline with some reasonable diameter, and then I draw it over the existing axes. And the, of course, you want to be precise with this so you're not making up the extents of your bars, and that's easy because um, it can snap your new anchor points to the existing ones that were exported by Excel here. So right now it's just going exactly to where that anchor point already is anyway. So that's nice. So now I have this uh, new rectangle for my axes, and I'm going to shift select that as well as the data. And then I'm just going to move it somewhere else and make my own labels and, and axis uh, you know, tick marks and everything. Delete all this other stuff that Excel exported because it's really not that um, easy to use. That's what I usually do. It's a little bit of a hassle, but then you end up with a plot like this that you can easily, you know, rescale and it looks totally reasonable. Um, you can change the shape and change the colors and um, all the other things that I showed you earlier on in this workshop. So that's pretty much everything I planned for today, uh, but I'll stick around for another half hour 
you guys want to play around and uh, I'll, I'll walk around and answer questions or try and troubleshoot things. Um, but as you leave, uh, please fill out this, uh, um, this sheet for uh, your evaluations and it'll be really useful. To me. I'll, I'll be right there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this, sorry, this, uh, this video. Yeah. yeah, so I recorded everything that was on the screen today. Um, and I assume Anik will send out the link in a couple of days. I need to figure out where it actually went on the Google uh, website.